Good morning. Welcome to worship at the St. John United Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm Dale Raines. I'm pastor here. For those of you in the room, you probably already knew that, uh, but for those who may be worshiping online with us, uh, I like to, to let you know uh, who you're watching and, and where we are, uh, and uh, it is good to, to be with you this morning. Uh, especially it's good to be with you this morning as I've been a little bit under the weather yesterday and quite frankly uh, this morning as well. I think I, I just have a, I have something that I haven't had in probably three years, a head cold. It's weird. I forgot what it felt like. I don't like it. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I'll be masking this morning and uh, trying to steer clear of you all as much as possible so that I, I don't, uh, don't share the blessings uh, of this, this little virus. But in any event, it is good to be here this morning. We look forward to, to what God may have for us on this day. And so I just invite you now to join us as we worship together. Thank you, Karen. All of your music is good, but when you play God's greatest hits, "Great is Thy Faithfulness," one of you know one of the greatest hymns of our of our faith. That's a real great way to start worship. Would you share with me now in our responsive reading? Do you feel it? God's kingdom is beneath our feet. shaped by God out of our brokenness. Do you know it? God's reconciling love in Christ has shattered our ways of viewing people. No longer do we label our sisters and brothers. We welcome them with open arms. Do you believe it? God has made everything, including us, new and sends us forth to share this good news with everyone. Pray with me, please. Loving God, when we wander to distant places, you watch and wait to greet us when we finally come home. Even when we are far from you, 
remind us that we are your beloved children, the longing of your heart, and give us the strength and courage to return to your open arms. When we have sinned against heaven and before you, forgive us, for we are coming home. Amen. may be seated. Recognizing our frailties and our failings, we come before God to offer our confession. I invite you to join in our prayer of confession, followed by a time for the lifting up of silent prayers or simply the keeping of silence. Let's pray. On this very day, waiting God, we admit all the lengths to which we go so we might avoid you. You offer us that kingdom of joy and wonder, yet we would hide in places where temptation waits. You invite us to feast on your grace and peace, but we stubbornly refuse because you also welcome those we call outsiders. We are quick to see all the mistakes that those around us make, but hope that you will ignore our foolish choices. Welcoming God, before we come to our senses, we find you running toward us, sweeping us up in your arms, tears of grace mingling with our cries of confession, an avalanche of love restoring us to new life. In Jesus Christ, we find no limitations on your grace, no reservations about your love, but a feast that overflows with wonder, a place we can finally call home. name of love personified, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Broken, we are made whole. Lost, we are brought home. 
we rejoice and give thanks to God who has graced us with mercy. Thanks be to God. Would you stand if you're able for the reading of the gospel from Luke this morning? This is from the New Revised Standard Version, so the, the wording may be a little different than what you're used to. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. He said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, yet no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came in and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. And he said, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. When he became angry and refused to go in, his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, and yet you've never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Holy One, thank you for the gift of this day and for the gift of this time together to focus on you and on what you would speak into our hearts and lives today. May our ears and most of all our minds be open to your spirit. Amen. I <coughs> excuse me, I was in high school 
when the first Star Wars movie came out. I still remember it quite vividly. Of course, the first one that came out was actually episode four, but we didn't know that then. Anyway, it was pretty clear in that movie that the central character of the story was Luke Skywalker. And he, he helped to rescue a princess. He discovered he had this mystical connection to something called the Force. And then the climax of the movie, he, with a little help from his friends, destroyed the Death Star. Well, that's what we thought. It seemed pretty clear. But years later, after George Lucas made the three prequels to the original trilogy, it became clear that Luke was not the central character of the story. All along, it was Anakin Skywalker or Darth Vader. It was a story of his fall and redemption. Well, the story in today's gospel reading is yeah, a, a bit like that. It's a story that Jesus told that has come to be known as the parable of the prodigal son. And admittedly, most of the story is occupied with the son's choices and the consequences of those choices. But... The real central character of the story, the character that I believe was the one that Jesus wanted those listening to him tell the story to pay the most attention to, was the father. It was the father's actions, the father's response to his sons that held the real lesson for them and for us. For most of us, it's a familiar, familiar story. A man has two sons. There's no mention of daughters. For the purposes of this story, it wouldn't have mattered because in that culture, daughters didn't figure into the inheritance. So, but one of the sons, the younger of the two, asks for his share of the inheritance. One commentator, N.T. Wright, has said that doing so while his father was still living would have been equivalent to saying, I, I wish you were already dead. For a son to do that would have been shocking to Jesus' listeners. But at least as shocking was what the father in the story did in response gave it to him. He just gave it to him. So Jesus' audience would have been shocked both by the son's demands and the father's response in meeting them. So the son takes the money and runs, gets far away, we're told, to a distant country, maybe trying to get some place where no one knew his family. No one associated him with his family or his father or that family name. But as often happens, the money runs out. And suddenly having no one who knew his family wasn't such a good thing. And anyway, finally he decides to return home, not to reclaim his place in the family, but to simply be treated and, and become as a servant in the household. But as Jesus tells the story, all that time, all that time that the son had been away, blowing his money, losing it, and then going through that process of, as the scriptures say, coming to himself, 
all that time the father has been waiting and hoping and watching. As Jesus described him, I, I can imagine him, as he went about his daily routine, his daily activities, frequently glancing down the road, just, just to see if the sun might be coming. Well, when he saw his wayward son, long before he arrived home, he again did something shocking. We're told in the story that he ran to meet him. Now, in that culture, men did not run. It was undignified. To do so, he would have had to raise up his robes and could have seen the lower part of his legs, and it just was not, was not dignified. A man didn't do such a thing. The father not only accepted the prodigal son back into the family, he celebrated his return through a party, spared no expense, didn't say, well, you can come home if you'll agree to this, this, and this. He, he, he didn't say, well, you can come back and be part of the family as long as you meet these conditions. It was an unconditional welcome, which ruffled the feathers of the other son, for whom life apparently was a rules and reward kind of equation. He lived in a world of scarcity where if dad threw a party for his brother, then there might not be enough for him. But the father made it clear we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. Well, we're focusing during Lent on spiritual practices, things that we can do to, to deepen our journey of faith. This story that focuses on the love and the unconditional welcome of the Father. In it, we see something that can be a powerful spiritual practice, a practice of hospitality. Now, not like in the hospitality industry where it's about offering amenities for a price. Hospitality in the spiritual sense is offering acceptance, Offering welcome that is without condition. So first, maybe we just need to adjust our thinking in terms of hospitality. We, need, we tend to think of it when we hear the word hospitality as having guests in our home, offering a meal, perhaps even, even an overnight stay, being polite and pleasant as a host. And we think of it similarly when we think in regard to hospitality in the church. A church that practices hospitality is friendly toward guests, maybe provides a cup of coffee, makes sure that they know the important stuff, like where the restrooms are. But is that all that hospitality really is? Hospitality is really just about how we treat people, how we interact with them. And Jesus himself, as we might expect, offers us a model, offers us examples to follow. Jesus welcomed and affirmed women, which was not in line with the cultural norms of the time and place, and yet he did it. Jesus welcomed and even touched those whom others avoided, lepers who were required to live outside of not only their family homes, but outside of the community. Jesus talked with them, touched them. 
And Jesus welcomed those seen as outsiders, as others, Gentiles, even Romans, the hated Roman occupiers. He offered all of these hospitality by being a welcoming presence, by being generous with his time, by opening his life to them, helping them to feel that they belonged rather than making them feel as if they were other. Is there any reason we can't do the same? We're seeing amazing examples of hospitality in the world right now in response to what's happening in Ukraine. Not only have countries been welcoming to, as of Thursday, 3.7 million refugees who have had to flee their homes. Individuals and families have also opened their hearts and their homes to them. It's a truly beautiful and inspiring thing that has come about in the midst of this horrific situation. Now, maybe you can't take in a Ukrainian family, but we can make the spiritual practice of hospitality part of our lives, regardless of that, regardless of how we might try to rationalize why we can't. We can open our lives to others. We can make others, we can act and speak in ways to make others feel valued. We can make an effort to help others feel a sense of belonging. We can include people in such a way as to help take away their feelings of otherness. Jesus had no home, had no possessions other than the clothes that he wore. And he did it. We can too. Amen. Would you stand if you're able? Join me in the affirmation of faith. <clears throat> we believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God, and that Christ's grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe in the birthing, renewing, enabling spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in green pastures and that hard times and disciplines are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination and that our path leads to a glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church we are fellow pilgrims on the road and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith which we are humbled to profess in Jesus the Christ. In our time of prayer, I invite you to offer up the prayers of your heart and then join as together we pray the prayer of our Savior. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you have called us together as your people to be the church of Jesus Christ. God, make us one in faith, 
breaking bread together, telling the good news, so that the world may believe that you are love. Turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Faithful God, embrace us with your hope. Creator God, you made all things and called them good. We pray for the earth in its vulnerability, depleted by our lifestyle choices and our economic expectations. Inspire reverence for the earth in all people. Guide us all to make wiser choices for the sake of your creation. Help us. Use resources wisely with future generations in mind, guarding the fragile balances that you've set between many precious species. Faithful God, embrace us with your hope. Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, you taught us of God's reconciling grace in the story of a father who welcomed back his wandering son and invited his jealous son to open his heart. Speak to the hearts of all your people in this time when so many neighbors and nations sit in judgment of each other, provoking conflict and resentment. Teach us how to seek peace on earth together. Call those in positions of power and influence to work for the common good and turn us away from anger and fear, violence and vanity, which can turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. May all who claim your name be known as makers of the peace. Faithful God, embrace us with your hope. O Christ, healer of hearts and hopes, you desire health and wholeness for each one of us, for black and white and brown and all others, for rich and poor, for straight and gay, gender, and for cis, gendered and transgendered. You desire life for us all. Grant rest and renewal to those who are broken in body, in mind, or in spirit. Bring comfort and hope to all who face loss and loneliness. In the silence of these moments, we lift before you the names of those on our hearts today. Spirit of power and promise, embrace us with hope this day so that we may live faithfully, encouraging each other by the love that we see in Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. O oh God, our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this? If you're worshiping with us online, I encourage you, if you've not already done so, to take a moment, maybe press the pause button on the video and go and gather elements that you can use to share in this holy time of communion with us. Friends, the Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give thanks to the Holy One. You created us to live in communion with you, O God, yet we turned away. We come reflecting on the mystery of the cross. We remember that on his final evening with his disciples, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. And after supper, Jesus did the same with the cup, saying, And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts on our behalf, we bring our whole selves to you as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. May this meal be for us signs of your great mercy, forgiveness of our sins, and promise of salvation. <laughs> Jesus said, take and eat in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, drink in remembrance of me. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit and join us in our prayer of thanksgiving. Lord Jesus Christ, you have nourished us in this meal and fed our bodies and our souls. We have heard your love, so send us out to speak it. We have seen your love, so send us out to show it. We have been fed on your love, so send us out to share it. And let all things be done for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we pause for uh, a moment before we continue in our, in our worship. I, I want to first say thank you to those who, who were here yesterday uh, and served to offer hospitality during Bachfest, opening our sanctuary and welcoming people in. I am so disappointed I didn't get to be here for that. I just was not feeling, not feeling like I ought to be interacting with people on that close, uh, in that close of a way. So 
a thank you to those of you who were here and who did that and uh, shared shared our message of inclusion and hospitality and love. Uh, I deeply appreciate you doing that. Uh, announcements in your bulletin, a couple of things that are uh, pertinent, especially for today. Uh, Easter is not so far off now, uh, three weeks, I believe, from today, and so it is time to get Easter lilies ordered. There is, a, I believe, a uh, order form in your bulletin, and so if you would like to, to order a lily or lilies in honor of someone or in memory of loved ones, uh, please uh, do that, uh, the, but they do need to be turned in today so that we can get them ordered and uh, get the lilies here on time. And uh, it wouldn't make much sense if they didn't get here until the week after Easter. So uh, please be mindful of that. And today also we are receiving our one great hour of sharing offering. An offering, as I have mentioned in the past, that we collaborate with a number of other denominations on, and it's an offering that goes to provide disaster relief, but also development uh, funds for uh, places around the world uh, who just need a little help to get going. Uh, so uh, be mindful of that as well. And one thing that is not in your bulletin that I've been asked to share is that uh, we are planning to have just some fun. Uh, a game night on Thursday evening, April 7th at 7.30 here at the church. Um, so be aware of that. I assume we'll be here in the sanctuary, probably in the, in the back. Uh, I think there are plans for perhaps some pizza and snacks uh, and just having a good time together. You know... Over the last two years, we haven't gotten to do that. And uh, so I know we have several folks who are really looking forward to being able to do this kind of thing again. So be mindful of that Thursday, April 7th at 7.30. And then the following Sunday after that is Palm Sunday, and we're going to invite folks who can and are able to do so to stay after worship uh, to help out with a little church cleanup day uh, after church on Sunday, April the 10th. So be mindful of that as well. Uh, lots of things going on in the life of the church here at St. John. But right now we're going to continue in worship. So I invite you to, to stand in body or in spirit and join us as we sing.
The song itself is a benediction, isn't it? Friends, go forth, O people of God. Go forth and offer a welcoming presence to the world, to so many who feel alone, to so many who, who feel ostracized and shut out. Go and offer that unconditional welcome. Go and be the church. In the name of God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit. Amen.